brothers and sisters. We are continuing in our series in Colossians. If you'd like to get your Bible ready, the passage for this evening is from chapter 1, verse 24, through to chapter 2 and verse 7. Before we read the passage, though, I thought it would be good to cover some context for this letter that Paul writes to the Colossians. Apostle Paul evangelizes in Ephesus between the years, excuse me, uh, between the years of roughly 52 and 57 AD. A Colossian visited Ephesus during Paul's evangelizing and took the word back to Colossae. So, although Paul did not personally plant the church in Colossae, he was one of the causes for the church to exist. After Paul finished his evangelism, there's about a five-year gap before his letter is written and sent to Colossae. In roughly the year 62 AD. The overarching reason for this letter is that there was a dangerous teaching threatening the church in Colossae. In particular, this false teaching was diminishing Christ's role and as such, undermined new believers' identity of being in Christ. Paul wrote and sent this letter to warn against this teaching and to ultimately counteract this false teaching. Let's now read the passage from verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body which is the church. I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. And may God bless the public reading of his word. We start off with Paul in verse 24 saying that he rejoices in suffering bit of a weird thing to say. One, how is he suffering? And two, why is he rejoicing? <coughs> Paul did not write this letter to Colossae in the comfort of his own home. He wrote this from a Roman jail. Despite being in jail and personally suffering, he could rejoice that his suffering was working for the good of others. Despite his own sufferings and the general persecution of the early church, the gospel message was spreading. The fact that there was a church in Colossae to write to is a testament to that with the Colossian visiting Ephesus and taking the word back to Colossae. The rest of verse 24 is where we meet our first hurdle, so to speak. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. The reason it is a hurdle is because of the afflictions part of the verse. Immediately, your mind may connect the afflictions in this verse with Calvary, Jesus giving his life up on the cross. So, is Paul saying here that Christ dying on the cross is somehow 
lacking. If that was what was Paul saying, it would literally be blasphemy. You'll be delighted to hear that we do not need to convene a committee regarding this statement. We forget that Christ also suffered in his ministry before he sacrificed himself. This is the afflictions that Paul refers to here. What is being said here is that Christ's afflictions are ongoing, just as we suffer similar afflictions when Christ ministers through us today, Christ still suffers. As Christ ministers through Paul, both he and Christ suffer whilst he is afflicted with imprisonment. But Paul does this for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul is not suffering for himself in this Roman prison. He is suffering for the sake of Christ's body, which is the church. This is an example of Paul following in Jesus' footsteps and being an others-centered person. He is not suffering for himself, but for the betterment of the church. Just as Paul was influencing churches across the known Eastern world at the time in his suffering, God also made good of the, of the suffering on a more personal level. In those times, some prisoners would be personally guarded if they were deemed to be important. Paul was one such prisoner. He would be guarded by Roman soldiers, and we read in Acts chapter 28 that he was even guarded by a centurion, no less. As such, Paul would be evangelizing to these guards as well as others further afield through his letters. God was working through Paul both locally in the prison and further afield. As we reach verse 25, we have to cover a slightly different translation to the one we read earlier. Paul calls himself a servant in the New International Version, which is not the best translation for the role he is speaking of here. The King James Version is a more accurate translation, as Paul calls himself a minister. And he was a minister for the early church, but not of his own appointment. Paul views himself as being divinely chosen for this role as minister by the commission of God. You could maybe accuse Paul of being a bit arrogant here. Who is he to say that he was divinely chosen? You can't just say something and expect people to believe it without evidence. There's only really one way to determine if Paul is being arrogant or not here. It's very much a case of it's not arrogant if it's true. The reason he isn't arrogant is because we can clearly see the evidence backing up his claim in the Bible. In the Bible, with what Paul was doing, we can see God working through Paul and that the work is bearing fruit. This is the proof to back up his claim. His work through the Lord was bearing fruit. Prosperity gospel preachers get found out eventually because God is not working through them and their work will not bear fruit. Paul was divinely chosen by God to be a minister in the early church as his work was bearing fruit. And as minister, his job was to present the world, the world, the word of God in its fullness. Paul did not withhold any part of the gospel. He didn't put a barrier between the people and the gospel or a barrier between the people and God. There was no paywall. There was no hoops to jump. He presented it to the world in its fullness. Paul is trying to convey to the world through God the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages. In the biblical sense, a mystery is not a problem or a puzzle that needs to be solved. It is a truth that can only be revealed through revelation. This truth was revealed by Jesus and is now being spread throughout the world by the disciples and apostles through God. The mystery that has been revealed to the Lord's people is that of the inclusion of the Gentiles. That Jews and Gentiles have been granted the same privileges. The privilege of a relationship with God and salvation. Quite the revelation for the Jews who thought they were the one and only chosen ones. It's no wonder we had groups at the time like the circumcision group calling for Gentiles to 
to still practice Jewish Old Testament law. We weren't there at the time, so we have no idea what a culture shock that must have been to the Jews, that all of a sudden Gentiles can also be saved. To compare it to a culture shock we may know more about, it is like the Refor Reformation. Not in the sense of the actual change that was caused, but in the scale of the culture shock that it caused. If you don't know what the Reformation is or was, it's a sermon in of itself. But suffice to say, it is how the Protestant branch of Christianity started. By protesting, hence Protestant, against the Catholic Church and papacy of the time. I highly recommend you look into the Reformation if you don't know much about it. The culture shock back then of Gentiles being of equal standing would be just as much, if not more of, a shock than our closest rival of the Reformation. You can see why a lot of Jews had a hard time with this mystery being revealed to them with such a shock it would have been. As we cross over into verse 27, we now see what is at the heart of this mystery that has been revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Both Jews and Gentiles alike could have Christ dwell within them. The barrier between God and his people is officially broken. Christ dwelling within us is the bridge to God. But this also reveals that salvation is not of our own toil, but it is the abiding presence of Jesus in our lives. Before we move on to cover the last two verses of this chapter, I thought it would be good to cover something that came up in my commentary, which builds on what we have just covered. The God of the Old Testament was sometimes called the hidden God. He was somewhat of a mystery. So much so, he would sometimes be called in Latin, Jus Absconditus, also known as the hidden God. But Jesus is referred to in Latin, Jus Revelatus, also known as the revealed God. Both in this specific sense, Jesus revealed the mystery of Jews and Gentiles being of equal standing in terms of salvation. But also, in the larger scheme of things, the mystery of God himself was revealed through Jesus. Although we weren't there to witness Jesus or hear firsthand from the disciples or apostles about him, Jesus, and by extension God, is revealed to us through the scriptures. Yes, we haven't seen Jesus face to face, like the disciples and the people of the time, but they don't have the privilege of having the full canon of scriptures to read through. We can read through all of the scriptures and see God revealed fully through Jesus. Moving on to the end of chapter 1, we have Paul in verse 28 saying, He is the one we proclaim. Paul is emphasizing the focus of his preaching. He did not preach himself, nor his own opinions. Paul preached Jesus. This is something that all preachers should be doing. I, as a preacher, should not be behind this lectern preaching about what I've been doing, nor should I be giving you my opinions. I am here to convey Jesus and Jesus alone. Although I and every other preacher takes their time to do their research and due diligence on the respective passages they've been asked to preach on, it should not be our own words that are spoken. It should be God's. This is what Paul was doing, proclaiming Jesus. Paul then goes on to say that we should be admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Admonishing is a bit of an unusual word, much like a lot of biblical language that isn't really used today. The best way I can describe this word is to actually cover where the translation comes from. It comes from an ancient Greek verb, which actually means to impart understanding or to lay on the mind or the heart. This verb means that, to, that we are to not only influence the intellect of our fellow human, but also the disposition of our fellow human. This admonishing of others was a passion for Paul. We read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 31 that for three years 
Paul never stopped warning people. Challenging someone intellectually about anything is relatively easy. What's two plus two? To which the minds of everyone in the room resounded the answer for, I hope. It's much more difficult to ask and discuss what's life all about. Paul does this so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Notice how he says everyone. Some of the false teachings in Colossae at the time was that salvation was beyond the understanding of the many and only meant for the select few. Paul is counteracting these teachings by regularly including everyone. The mystery of God is revealed to everyone. But it is also so that we may, we may be mature in Christ. What is meant by this is that we do not need to depend on anyone else or even ourselves. We depend on Christ. We haven't sung the song in a while, but the lyrics of Cornerstone sum this up really well. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, Cornerstone. Weak made strong in the Saviour's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. The sweetest frame could be false teaching like that of the time in Colossae, or it could be like that of the prosperity gospel in today's day. However, as the lyric continues, we should wholly trust in Jesus' name. As we come to the end of chapter 1, Paul is strenuously contending with the energy within him. Paul is saying that his work was empowered by God to do the things he is doing. Paul still did the work, but through God. Another bit of evidence to back up his claim of being divinely chosen. To try and give you a relevant modern day example of this energy, I'm going to give you a modern comparison. And I hope you won't mind me using him as an example here. But I'd like to talk about one of our elders, Ali Miller, for a second. This guy is high up in his 9 to 5 company, making important high-level decisions on top of his own actual work. At home, he has a young family, all with their own extracurriculars. And we regularly see this young family with footballing attire on, with Ali also being a coach for this, for these footballing extracurriculars. All of this whilst being an elder. I'm saying this just to give you some context of how busy he is outside of church, and that's just the stuff I know of. I remember going through the tester of visual theology course with Ali that he organized and ran a few years back, and I asked him several times, how does he have the time and energy to do all of these things in his normal life and that stuff, all this stuff that he does in the church. His answer, God will provide, God gives me the energy. And he is correct. Under normal circumstances, I don't think any of us would have the energy to do all the things that we do, including our church life. It is God that gives us the energy to do his work. And just as Paul was divinely chosen to be a minister of the early church, through due process, the elders are divinely chosen to be elders. To be clear, I'm not putting the elders or any singular elder on a pedestal, and I hope I don't get a slap on the wrist for name-checking one. But every time something like this comes up in a passage, we need some sort of comparison and modern-day example to truly understand certain things. This is all I'm trying to do here. The energy that Paul is contending with here in the passage, the energy that's flowing through Paul, is the same energy that can flow through us when we are doing God's work. We are now more or less halfway through our passage this evening as we now move in to chapter 2. In verse 1, Paul is trying to convey to the people in Colossae how much he cares for them. It comes across better in the King James Version. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you. This is not an idol. I hope you're doing well from Paul to Colossae. Paul has genuine heartfelt care for these people. 
This is a heartfelt care for a lot of people he hasn't even met. For all who have not met me personally. If you remember from chapter 1 verse 7, it was someone called Epaphras who took back what he heard from Paul to Colossae. This also just goes to show how much authority and influence Paul had. You would think Paul's influence would be on just the church in and around Israel, maybe even in and around the areas of his missionary trips, but the influence extends much further afield than the places he set foot on. Just as Paul's authority extended to those he never met at the time, it also extends to us. This letter from Paul to Colossae is also meant for us. Yes, this letter was sent to a specific set of people at a specific time with specific problems, the false teachings we covered earlier. And so long as we take heed of that historical context, this letter does still apply to us today. We also need to be wary of false teachings just as the Colossians did. And we should also have heartfelt care for fellow Christians, like Paul had for the Colossians. There is a reason we now have dedicated missionary prayer mornings, why we have regularly updated the missionary board in the foyer, and this is also why we have regular, regular missionary offerings. We should care for our fellow Christians further afield. Now in reading the first verse of chapter 2, I originally did not see how Laodicea came into it. If it's mentioned in the Bible, it must be important. But surprisingly, some commentaries don't even cover why Laodicea is mentioned. I did a bit of digging, and as it turns out, Laodicea was the nearest city to Colossae, roughly nine miles away. Laodicea also had a church in it, and the churches both in Laodicea and Colossae had a close relationship. Paul must have known about the church in Laodicea the same way he knew about the church in Colossae. So, Paul, knowing the relationship between these two churches, continues to show his care for them both as he doesn't forget to mention the other church in Laodicea. Paul wanted these Christians to be encouraged in heart. The Greek word Paul used here has several meanings. In this use of the word, Paul wanted to enable these Christians to face difficult situations with confidence and gallantry. Gallantry means to face difficult situations with courage. The Christians of the time, and also we in today's day and age, should be confident and courageous when facing difficult situations. And we should be encouraging our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to also be confident and courageous, like Paul is doing here with the Colossians. That does not mean that we should be arrogant when facing difficult situations. But we should also not shy away from them. If our faith is challenged, or in this case, a false teaching is doing the rounds, we should be confident and courageous enough to stand up to it. So, for example, say I was to stand behind this lectern and start spouting prosperity gospel. It is not just on the elders to challenge me on that. It is everyone's responsibility to challenge me on that. And it should be challenged with confidence and courage. We should not be afraid to speak out when we think something, someone has said something wrong or is teaching something wrong. That does not mean, like in any British Parliament building, that we should start booing the person behind the lectern as they speak. It should be handled with tact, but handled nonetheless. Paul also wanted the people in Colossae, and by extension us today, to be united in love. Unfortunately, the English language being what it is, we only have one word for love. So what kind of love are we actually speaking about here? There is a reason that a lot of people, when referring to their fellow Christians, say brothers and sisters in Christ. The love that is being talked about here is familial love. To put this into perspective, I have a sister called Katie, as most of you know. As big brother, it is my job to annoy her as much as humanly possible until she has a boyfriend to do that for me. However, as her brother, should anything happen 
I will be there for her and no one will get in my way. This is the familial love that Paul and Jesus wants us all to unite over. Paul then goes on to write so that they might have the full riches of complete understanding. Paul understood that it wouldn't just be familial love that would unite Christians. It would also be that groups of Christians would unite as they grew in their understanding of God's truth. If we did not need to grow together in understanding of God's truth and just needed familial love, all there would be on a Sunday is the coffee and teas we have in the morning extended by an hour or so. There is a reason we have teaching and preaching on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. We are to unite in love and to grow together in understanding. We are to grow together in the understanding of the mystery that is God revealed now to us through Christ. Verse 3 is where Paul counteracts these false teachings in Colossae directly. Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Going back to the introduction, the false teaching was trying to diminish Christ. Colossians were being told to seek wisdom and knowledge elsewhere as well as Christ. It is not wrong to seek wisdom and knowledge, but Paul is very clear on this matter. You will only find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Jesus. Some note must be taken of the word choice Paul uses here. He calls Jesus' wisdom and knowledge a treasure. This is to emphasize that these things are precious. I know 2 plus 2 equals 4, but how does that rank with knowing that Christ died, Chris, Christ died on the cross to pay for all of my sins? That kind of knowledge is precious. Moving on to verse 4, Paul continues to answer the false teaching directly. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. These people who were telling, uh, who were telling the Colossians to seek additional wisdom and knowledge apart from Jesus were persuasive. The lure of more understanding of something can be enticing to most. Just because something or someone is persuasive does not mean that they are correct. We are lucky of having the full Bible to refer to. We can compare teachings with what the Bible and by extension what God says. If it lines up, we are good to go. If it does not line up, we should challenge it with courage and tact. Paul then goes on to say that he is with the Colossians in spirit. Being Christians, we are spiritual people. If you claim to be a brother and sister in Christ, but not spiritual, we would have a problem. So how do we be with our brother and sister Christians in spirit? Through prayer. Paul would be praying for all of these Christians he was sending letters to. Just as we pray for our fellow congregation members, the missionary endeavours we support, and the world at large. The best way I can bring this being in spirit with fellow Christians to life is to talk about how I have experienced it. In my late teens, just after I started working, my gran passed away. It was the first major familial loss for me and it hit me hard. I couldn't tell you exactly when, but soon after the initial loss hit me, there was a calmness that befell me. I was still grieving and upset but I also had the feeling that everything was going to be okay. It wasn't until after I returned to church after the loss that I found out that my brothers and sisters here were praying for me and my family. That's when it clicked for me, just some of the power that prayer has. I personally believe it's the prayers on behalf of me and my family that gave me that calmness. My church was with me in spirit with my loss through prayer. Paul was with the Colossians in spirit through prayer and their struggle against this false teaching. Paul carries on in this verse to say he's delighted to see the discipline and firm faith the Colossians have. This church was not full of heresy or blasphemy. It was not a church com gone completely off the rails. 
If this is the case, then why would Paul need to send this letter in the first place? Because they were still in danger. Not even the strongest of churches are immune to problems. Some of the words used in this verse are translated from military terms. Paul is conveying that although they are under attack, their battle lines are unbroken. They are firm in the faith of Jesus. As we reach the penultimate verse of this evening, we are told to continue to live our lives in Christ just as we received him. This means that we did not receive Christ in the flesh, but in the spirit. And what has begun in the spirit could not be continued in the flesh. Living through Jesus is the only way to continue that spiritual growth. We cannot receive the attributes and qualities of holiness apart from Jesus. Again, another rebuttal to the false teaching that somehow spiritual things could be attained through endeavours of the flesh. As we come to a close and now on to the final verse, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Being rooted gives us connotations of a tree. In the sense of the parable of the sower, these roots should be deep and wide so that we may be built up in him as in to grow up in him like a tree so that this tree may bear fruit. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 23 says this, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. We should be seeds fallen on the good soil, rooting deep and wide into it. So much so that we may be built up in Christ, so that if challenges come our way, we can face them with courage and confidence. As we continue to grow, we should then bear fruit for our fellow brothers and sisters to see. Amen. That's our um, evening service now over. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, I hope you all have a blessed week and I'll see you on Friday or Sunday.